Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good to see you here today in our Bible class. And uh, we're going to continue in our uh, subject where we're talking about apologetics. As you know, learning to defend our faith. And uh, today we're going to consider the subject of reasons to believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Now, you might remember that when we started talking about apologetics, there were two, we said there were two major pillars that we need to learn to defend. <clears throat> and one is the existence of God as our Creator and uh, our Savior. But also the second pillar is the idea that the Bible is the Word of God. If we can prove these two things, as we said, if we can prove the Bible is the Word of God, all the rest is exegesis and learning to deal with people from the Scripture. So this is a very big, monumental issue right here. This is the issue that's under attack. We could say this is really ground zero of apologetics. And so we're going to consider this today. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, if uh, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance, the only thing that it cannot be is moderately important. So very true. Christianity is either false or it's not. And if it's not false, then it is infinitely important because people's eternity is based on that. And so really, with regard to this issue, the Bible is really the foundation of our, our Christian faith, because all of our faith really rests upon a book. Is that not true? I mean, all, tell me what you know. Now, there are some historical references, but aside from that, what do you know about Jesus outside this book? What do we know about God outside the book? Of course, we know that there's natural revelation, but God's special revelation is where he, he reveals himself. And so, <clears throat> as Christians, we stake not only our entire lives but also our eternity on the Scripture. It's all based upon the Word of God. And so this is a subject that, would you agree with me, that deserves serious consideration. This is a, this is a monumental subject. And we're going to spend the next few weeks giving reasons why we can know with assurance that the Bible is the Word of God, um, with absolute certainty that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, this is, where, this is being attacked today. There's not a lot of people that believe that the Bible is God's Word. A typical view would be Bill Meyer, who said this, quote, I don't believe God is a single parent who writes books. I think that the people who think God wrote a book called the Bible are just childish. How do you believe God wrote a book called the Bible? Would you raise your hand if you believe that? Okay, well, you're childish. You're just childish. That's your problem. According to Bill Meyer and then Bruce Willis, <clears throat> he said this, he said, organized religions in general, in my opinion, are dying forms. They were all very important when we didn't know why the sun moved, what, uh, why weather changed, why hurricanes occurred or volcanoes happened. Modern religion is the end of the trail of modern mythology. But there are people who interpret the Bible literally, literally. <laughs> he makes the emphasis there. I choose not to believe that's the way. Again, I think that these two opinions here represent kind of the secular viewpoint that people have today with reference to uh, the Scripture, the Word of God. Here's another man. You've probably heard of this actor, Sir Ian McKellen. Uh, when he was on the Today Show, he was asked if the film, which he starred in alongside Tom Hanks, uh, The Da Vinci Code, needed a disclaimer. He said, well, I've often thought the Bible should have a disclaimer in the front saying, this is fiction. He said, I mean, walking on water takes an act of faith. Well, if you're the son of God, maybe not so much. You know, he can, he, he can do anything since he's the creator. But nevertheless, again, this kind of represents the typical viewpoint that people have today with reference to the Bible. No longer, you know, there was a, there was a time when you can go out and you can knock on the door and witness to people. And people just believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it's from God. But I want to tell you, we just can't make that assumption anymore because there's all these attacks that come from secular culture today that question the Bible, that question whether it is the word of God. They say, well, it's a holy book just like any other holy book. And it was written by man. Now, it doesn't come from God. And so how do we answer, answer questions like this? Does the Bible need a disclaimer? Uh, is it childish to believe it? Uh, in an increasingly skeptical world, we need to be ready to answer those kinds of questions and give good reasons for the veracity of the Christian faith. 
Let me just give an extended quote here from Dan's story in his book, Defending the Faith. He said, if Christians can demonstrate that the Bible is truthful in all areas in which it can be validated, we have before us the most powerful and compelling evidence for the truthfulness of Christianity. He goes on to say, every apologetic argument rests on the reliability of the Bible, including the deity and the resurrection of Christ. He's absolutely right. He goes on to say, all religions in the world claim to possess divine truth and make emphatic statements about the nature of God. And the question of sin, the destiny of man, and other critical issues. If one approaches all religions in the same fashion, if one accepts or rejects them based solely on the evidence, he will soon discover that the Bible alone can sustain its truth claims. Now, I believe that passionately. I believe that the Bible can sustain its own truth claims, that the Bible can sustain the most, um, uh, the most uh, radical uh, scrutiny given to it by man. But remember, I told you, I, you heard me say this before, there's a, there's a difference between an honest outer and a dishonest outer. A dishonest outer is not going to believe no matter what you give them. But if a person who's an honest outer puts the Bible under scrutiny and is honestly looking for the truth, he's going to come to believe that the Bible can sustain its truth claims, that the Bible is the word of God. Dan's story goes on to say, this is vital if Christianity is to attract skeptics and advocates of other religions. There has to be some kind of objective and testable evidence to verify religious truth claims. Or there would be no way to determine which religion, if any, among the hundreds of contenders actually expresses divine revelation. And then he, he, finally he says, if the Bible alone can sustain its truth claims in areas in which it can be investigated, then it is reasonable to trust in, in, in spiritual matters, we have a solid foundation for which to assert that what the Bible says about Jesus as Lord and Savior, sin and its consequences, and the path to salvation must be correct. And if what the Bible says is true, contrary, to, to, uh, contrary religious claims, then must be false. And that's, that's true. Um, if the Bible is true, uh, every other religious claim has to be false. Because Jesus didn't say, I am a way, right? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not one of many ways. Like someone who has more of a pluralistic mindset would say, well, you know, there's many roads to the top of the mountain. You know, we're, you, know you might be on the, uh, the Christian road, I'm on the Buddha road, or I'm on the Islam road, and, and so on, but they're all valid roads. No, that option is not left open. Because the Bible doesn't give it that option. If the Bible's true, then Jesus is the only way. You see, so if we prove the Bible is indeed the word of God, then what that does is that debunks all these other religious contenders because the Bible speaks truth and Jesus spoke truth. And so therefore, Jesus is the only way the Bible presents the gospel as the exclusive way to salvation. The only way Now that's not very popular to say today in this uh, pluralistic world in which we live. Uh, some people would say that that's being very narrow minded. Um, but again, I would point to our Savior, Jesus himself, who was, shall I say, narrow minded when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Uh, how many of you ever heard of the name R.A. Torrey? R.A. Torrey, anybody hear that name? If you ever read, get a book by R.A. Torrey, go ahead and buy it and read it. Uh, he's a very excellent Bible scholar who lived um, back in the um, early 20th century. Um, he, was, uh, he found himself confronted with doubts about whether or not the Bible was true as a young man. Now, he was taught as a young man from his home uh, that, you know, from his parents, that the Bible indeed was the word of God. And, um, you know, he would later recount his experience of beginning to have doubts about that. He said this. He said, I was brought up to believe the Bible was the word of God in early life. I accepted it as such upon the authority of my parents and never gave the question any serious thought. But later in, in life, my faith in the Bible was utterly shattered through the influence of the writings of a very celebrated scholarly and brilliant skeptic. I found myself face to face with the question, why do you believe the Bible is the word of God? So he, he confronted this question himself. I would dare say that any young person who uh, has their own faith, not the faith of their parents, but their own faith, has to grapple with that question. Have you ever, ever asked yourself that question? Why do I believe the Bible is the word of God? And, and R.A. Torrey 
was confronted with this when he was bombarded by skeptics. And by the way, how many of you know our young people, when they leave church, they're being bombarded by skeptics all over? They're trying to take away their faith and their foundation. He said, I had no satisfactory answer. I determined to go to the, Bible, to the bottom of this question. If satisfactory proof could not be found that the Bible was God's word, I would give the whole thing up, cost what it might. If satisfactory proof could be found that the Bible was God's word, I would take my stand upon it, cost what it might. And so this was the dilemma that was before him, before R.A. Torrey. He was going to investigate the issue for himself. Was the Bible God's word or was it not? He went on to say, um, I doubtless had many friends who could have answered the question satisfactorily, but I was unwilling to confide to them the struggle that was going on in my own heart. So I sought help from God and from books. And after much painful study and thought came out of the, doc, of the darkness of skepticism into the broad light, daylight of faith and certainty that the Bible from beginning to end is the word of God. And remember, I told you, anyone who's really searching to know the truth, who is honestly wanting to, to get to know the truth and seeking the truth, I believe that God will reveal that truth to them. If they're honestly open and searching, and this is exactly what happened to R.A. Torrey, the same experience happened to G. Campbell Morgan. This experience happened to Billy Graham when he, when at a time in his life when he began to question the Bible. And he became so certain that uh, later a biography was written about this called uh, his life called Apostle of Certainty. <laughs> that wouldn't go over very well in this postmodern generation. How can you be certain about anything, they would say. R.A. Torrey was called the Apostle of Certainty. And this investigation led to the sure conclusion that the Bible was indeed what it claimed to be. So armed with this assurance, he would go on to become one of the leading evangelists and pastors of the early 20th century. Uh, he joined D.L. Moody in doing much evangelistic work, leading citywide revivals and crusades in the U.S. and in other parts of the world, was greatly used of God. And R.A. Torrey would later come up with a book, as a result of his investigation, actually just a booklet called 10 Reasons Why I Believe the Bible is the Word of God. And uh, that's a very helpful book. And again, I would commend that to you if you ever wanted to do some reading on this and get some information about it yourself. This is a good book to get with respect to this issue. And this is the issue that we want to consider here. Uh, this is the issue that we want to talk about again we want to talk about reasons to believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. And so um, let me just say, first of all, in this discussion, the Bible itself makes the claim to be the word of God. All right. You have to understand that uh, when we say the Bible is the word of God, we're not throwing upon the Bible an outside objective uh, opinion about the Bible. The Bible itself claims to be the word of God. Okay? There are scriptures in the, in the Bible that claim, that make the claim that this is the word of God. Okay? And so we want to we consider that. Uh, the Bible is the word of God, wrote Christian theologian H.D. McDonald. Such is the verdict to which our considerations have led us. And this verdict has the certain witness and warrant of the Bible It self. The Bible itself makes this claim that these are the very words of God. Okay. For example, did you know that over 2000 times in the Old Testament from the beginning, from Genesis all the way to Malachi, the assertion is made that God spoke what is written in these pages, that God spoke 2000 times. Okay. For example, in Exodus and Moses wrote all the what? words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under, and under the hill and so on. So Moses wrote himself the words of the Lord in Deuteronomy. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. God says, I'm commanding you. This is what I'm giving you. The words of that you have are my words. I've given these to you. Second Samuel 23, 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke, spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And so when the prophets prophesied, and it was written down, they were giving the words of God. 
His word was in my tongue. And then in Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And then in Jeremiah 26, 2, thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house. And how many times have we seen that expression in the Old Testament? Thus saith the Lord. And then he goes on to say, and, and, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to the worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak. And so uh, we have this all throughout the Old Testament where the word of God, the Bible makes the claim that it is the words of God. And then on into the New Testament as well. This theme continues on. We see the phrase, the word of God, that occurs uh, over 40 times uh, in the New Testament in Luke eleven twenty eight. But he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. And then, of course, a verse that we all know for the word of God is what? Quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword. Uh, the word of God is so sharp that it can not it doesn't pierce the physical body. It pierces the soul. It cuts us in our spirit, in our soul. Uh, it is a convicting word. It's alive. And it discerns the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And so without apology or qualification, the Bible declares that it was written by men under the inspiration of God. Uh, or under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it is the word of God. And of course, we all know this verse, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And we'll look at this verse a little closer, but another important verse with reference to the doctrine of inspiration is 2 Peter one twenty one, For the prophecy came not in old, old time by the will of man, or, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. Now, how many of you were here with me last week? And you heard me talk about this principle of concurrence. Remember when I talked about that? Where something is done by man and yet it's also at the same time done by God. Well, this principle applies with reference to the inspiration of the Bible. And I made that point last week. That who wrote the Bible? If you say man wrote the Bible, you would be right. But if you say God wrote the Bible, you would also be right. Because God used the human instrumentality of man to give us the scripture. These men were, as the Peter says here in this verse here, they were, they were carried along. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word for moved here is actually a fisherman's term that talks about a boat that's being pushed along by the wind. When the boat's sails are up. Have you ever been sailing and, and, uh, on a sailboat? When they put those sails up, the wind just pushes it along. Uh, and this is the term that you expect a fisherman like Peter to know that word, right? Who had a boat himself. This is the word that he used, that the men of God, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit when they gave us the word of God. And just a few key terms to know with reference to the doctrine of inspiration. Number one, revelation. And this is the act whereby God reveals the truth to mankind through both special revelation, that is scripture, prophets, and so on, and natural revelation. And then, of course, inspiration. Inspiration is the act whereby God guided the writers of scripture, giving them his words, while fully utilizing the human element within man to produce the scripture. And I'll, and I'll uh, talk about that just a little bit more in a minute. But also just know the term illumination. This is the act whereby God enlightens people to understand his revelation and its relevance to their lives. So you have revelation, you have inspiration, you have illumination. Uh, and so we need to know the difference between those terms because sometimes we can get them mixed up. Uh, it's like the one preacher who was uh, nervous on his first sermon. And he said, God, I pray that you will eliminate my mind today. He didn't want God to eliminate his mind. He wanted God to illuminate his mind. And the truth of the matter is, unless God, the Holy Spirit, opens our eyes to see truth, we're not going to see it. And I think I've made this point with you before uh, that we have, you know, what it, epistemology is how we learn, how we get knowledge. We get knowledge through sight, through hearing, through the senses, through study, investigation. And those are all legitimate ways to get knowledge. But as a Christian, you need that plus one extra step. Uh, you need a sixth sense 
you could say. And what is that sixth sense? That is the Holy Spirit inside of you that opens your eyes to see the truth. If you had all those other empirical ways of learning and investigation and you didn't have that sixth sense, you didn't have that Holy Spirit, you really wouldn't get it. You might get some of the facts, but you're not going to get the truth into your heart. It has to be the Holy Spirit that does that. And that's what illumination is. So, again, we have these three specific terms with reference to God, what God does. God gives us revelation in the scripture. God inspires man to write. And it's God who illuminates us to understand the truth, to understand the writing of scripture. Uh, One other issue I want to touch on because it'll be relevant for later on. Where does inspiration lie? Because this is a big issue um, that has been kicked around in theology. Where does inspiration actually lie? Is it in the mind of God? Is it in the mind of the author? Is it with the written words? Or with the message proclaimed? Or the message received? Uh, Where does the actual inspiration lie? And again, this is uh, something that has been debated. God gives the revelation. He also gives illumination to us to receive the message. But the inspiration actually lies in the written message itself. What does 2 Timothy 3.16 say? All scripture is given by inspiration. The word scripture, graphe, is where we get the word graphite from. What do we use graphite to do? Make pencils, right? The actual writing. We could say the actual written words. So where does the inspiration lie? Inspiration lies in the actual written words itself. Not in the thoughts. God didn't inspire the thoughts. And then the writer write down whatever he want uh, based on the thought. But the writer writes down the very words. The inspiration is in the very words itself. This is an important understanding here. It's not in the actual writer. The inspiration isn't in the writer. Because if, if, if the inspiration was in the writer, that means that everything that Paul wrote would have been inspired. Let me ask you a question. Did everything that Paul wrote, was it inspired scripture, everything that he wrote? Not everything. Because did you know that there were actually four letters written to the Corinthian church by Paul? Four? Two of them, we don't know where they are. They got lost in the mail. You ever lose anything in the mail? Well, I mean, they did get to their destination, but now we don't know where they are. God didn't preserve those letters. What does that tell you about those letters? They were not inspired. Inspiration is not in the writer. Inspiration is in the actual words that God gives. And when God inspires his word, what's he going to do with that word? He's going to preserve it because those are his words. And so when we say inspiration, then it's in the the word. It's not the product of human genius as we would say, the works of Shakespeare or Dante or Homer. It's not limited to the thoughts of the writers. It's not the act of God on the reader. I've heard that view about inspiration. You know, you're reading along, you're reading along, all of a sudden, wow, that one really got me, that verse. That verse was inspired. As if to say all the rest of it was not. In other words, the act of inspiration really is on the reader. When God uh, inspires me through something that he wrote here, it's, it's, it's really on the reader. It's not that. It's not the product of mechanical dictation, although there may be times when God did dictate to his people in the Old Testament. What we mean by that is that the writers didn't come under some kind of a trance and become like writing robots and just spew out all this knowledge that they just didn't know, didn't have. You know, as much as I've prayed for that on a test sometimes in seminary, Lord, give me knowledge I don't have. Just help my hand to start write the answer, you know. Doesn't work. That's not what we're talking about with inspiration here. Again, all scripture, and this is, uh, the, you have this, the, 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 the uh, words, Greek words in red, pasa all, graphe, theonoustos, all written words, literally, theo, God, Nustas from uh, the breath of breathed out, literally come out from the mouth of God. So, you know, when I'm speaking here, my breath is coming out of my mouth uh, over my tongue, through my teeth to make words. I'm breathing out every time I speak. 
That's the idea here, that the written words came from God's mouth. That's the thing that we, that's the concept that I want you to grasp. That's what inspiration is. It lies in the actual written words themselves. Which is why, you know, people sometimes ask me, what kind of English translation do you prefer? I prefer a word for word translation from the original Greek and Hebrew into the English. I don't like, you know, there's two kinds of basic Bible translations. There's dynamic equivalence, which is thought for thought. Or there is actually formal translations, which are word for word translations. And those are the translations that I point people to, because, again, that's the way we got the Bible, not the thoughts of the writers, but the actual words themselves. I want to know the word that God gave, because it's inspiration lies in the words. Now, some of you ask me, what are the difference? Well, I think the formal translations obviously, obviously is the King James New King James American Standard, English Standard Version. Um, those are the ones that I think have a word-for-word -word formal translation of the original Greek and Hebrew languages. Some of those English translations are just thought for thought. And some of them aren't even the Bible. They're just commentaries. They're just man's commentary on what the original word said. You have to be careful with that. And so, again, we see the human element in the writings um, and uh, the human element in Scripture, that's there. Um, we can't discard that or throw it away because God inspired the writer, but God was behind everything in that writer's life so that the word that he, ch he chose was the word that God had already chosen from eternity past. We see the human element in Scripture, don't we? Of course we do. We see it in the Psalms, the emotion of David, and in, uh, in Galatians, we see Paul's anger. Uh, we see grammatical differences in the writing between John and Luke and Paul. Uh, we see language, use the language of observation, uh, where, you know, Josh would say the sun stood still, or the sun rose and the sun set, and so on. That's the language we still use today. And some, sometimes, you know, people will criticize the Bible and say, oh, the Bible says the sun stood still and the, and the sun doesn't move. Well, you said that the sun rises and sets. We use that language all the time, um, and that doesn't discount um, the Bible or, or make it an error in any way, and then the use of round numbers. So we could say it like this, that, that basically the Bible is 100% written by man, but also 100% inspired by God. Remember I told you that that's concurrence. Just like Jesus was 100% man and 100% God, even so the Bible has that same kind of dynamic to it. It, was, it is a work of God. It's inspired by God through the personality, circumstances, uh, education, background of the writers. And so um, we could say this. The, it's the act where God, by God guided the writers, giving them his words while fully utilizing the human element within man to produce the scripture. When we say inspiration, we use the word verbal, which extends to the very words of scripture, not to the teachings, just the teachings. And we use the word plenary, which means extends to everything in the Bible, not just parts of the Bible, but all of the Bible. Everything is fully inspired, verbally inspired by God. OK, any questions from the class on this so far? Everybody with me? Can I get an amen? amen. All right. All right. Let me just give you this definition here. This is a. Uh, I think this is a great definition by, uh, by John MacArthur. He said this, Inspiration is God's revelation communicated to us through writers who use their own minds and their own words. God so, had so arranged their lives, their thoughts, their vocabularies, that the words they chose were words that God determined from eternity past and, and, they would, and that they would use to write his truth. That's a very good summary of the, of the idea and the concept of inspiration as given to us in the scripture. So again, we would say that it is um, given to us by God, moved upon the Holy Spirit, upon man. He you, used the human personality in giving us the inspired text of scripture. So we have the inspired word of God. 
uh, this is what Erwin Lutzer said. In effect, God signed every page of the Bible, writes Erwin Lutzer. We have every reason to believe that his signature was not forged. God has spoken and he has told us so. Now, this is what we believe. This is what we hold to. Inspiration. I can't, I can't overemphasize the importance of this one thing right here, this, this doctrine right here. Because if the Bible is not the inspired word of God, how can we be sure about anything? All of our theology, all of our faith, everything is based upon that the Bible is the inspired word of God. This is his inspired word. Now, just for the record, I believe that with every fiber of my being, I, my, I cry out, this is the word of God. Now, when uh, years ago, when uh, we were in, let me see, three, three buildings ago when Pastor Johnson was a pastor, and we had the original building over here that's now the education building, on a Sunday night, Pastor Johnson uh, gave an invitation. I, I, was, I was 16, I think, at the time. And he said, how many of you young men feel like you're called to preach? And nine other guys raised their hand, and then I raised mine. And he said, if you really believe it, stand up. Well, I, don't, I was kind of shy. I didn't really want to stand up. But I went ahead and stood up. He said, if you really believe it, come down here to the front of this altar. Well, man, I didn't want to do that. But I, nine other guys were down there first, and then I came down. And then he had some of the deacons come and put their hand on our shoulder and pray over us. And some of you might remember Charlie Carper. Anybody remember him? <clears throat> Anybody here? He was, he was the deacon that came and prayed, prayed for me. And then the next day I, I thought, you know, Lord, I, I don't want to play games. I don't know if I really mean that. I want to be sure that, um, that I'm really called. I want to make sure of that. And then I, I kind of prayed and, and got some assurance on that. But here's the one thing that God did to me in my heart that helped me with this whole call and that is, he placed within my heart this deep, deep conviction that the Bible is the word of God. And that what the world needs to hear is God's word. They need to hear from God. Wouldn't you agree with that? They don't need my opinion. They don't need my whatever brilliance. They need the word of God. And part of the call to preach, and I tell this to students when I teach homiletics, that if you don't have that deep conviction of the inspiration of Scripture, you need to, you know, you're probably not called. Because this becomes part of it, I believe, um, that the Bible is the Word of God. And you let me hear a preacher preach for about 10 minutes, and I'll tell you what he really believes about the Bible. Because if this is the Word of God, and it is, then our task needs to be to make it clear what God says. Because God does the work in His Word. He's the one who gets it done. So this is a monumental issue. This is why all the guns of the devil are aimed at the scripture to attack the scripture. And again, we get back to the question, how can we know? But how can we as Christians be confident in accepting such claims? Like the famous reformer John Calvin said, we cannot rely on the doctrine of scripture until we are absolutely convinced that God is its author. So are you absolutely convinced about that? And how do you convince others of that? Again, that's what we're talking about. That's why we're talking about reasons to believe that the Bible is the word of God. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about some of these reasons. And we'll probably only get to one, maybe two today. But in the next few weeks, I want to give you several reasons. And then use these reasons to help bolster your faith and for you to be able to go out and tell others that the Bible is indeed the word of God. And let's, let's talk about the first reason. I would say it's scientific accuracy. Scientific accuracy. Okay? Because when the Bible speaks on issues relating to science, it is scientifically accurate. Now, you understand the logic behind this, right? We know that the Bible is not a science book. But if the God who created the universe wrote a book, you would expect that that book would be in harmony with the facts of creation, right? Or we could say the science of creation. If the same God who created the heavens and the earth gave us his word, there would be not contradictions in, in the Bible with reference to science, right? 
we would expect that book to speak intelligently when it came to issues of science. All right, let me give you an example. Did you know that the Quran says that um, when God created man, uh, he made him out of clay and put, put him in the oven, and then uh, the first time he did it, he didn't leave man in long enough, he pulled him out, and that's where we get the white man. That's according to the Quran. And then he, he did it again, made, made some clay, put it in the oven, left it in too long, and that's where we get the black man. And then the Quran says that he did it a third time. He made man out of clay, put him in the oven, left him in just right. That's where we get the brown skinned person. Um, that's their scientific explanation of the different uh, so-called races. Of course, we know there's only one race, right? The human race. The whole concept of racism is not in the Bible. We are all from Adam. All of us. We're all one big family. Did you know that uh, it says that, you know, the sky, uh, you know, when it talks about creation, um, that uh, it uses, you know, it, there, you know, the stars were actually torches up in the sky and that sort of thing. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is if you compare some of the scientific facts and these so-called other holy books like the Quran and uh, the Hupa uh, Tishan, I think it's called uh, in Hinduism and uh, other holy books. Uh, or even uh, the Book of Mormon. If you look at what they have to say about science, it's ridiculous when you compare it to the Scripture. The Bible stands up to the most uh, strong, the strongest scrutiny of scientists. Now, so when you compare the science and, to, to, and you compare the Bible, what you find is there's a harmony between scientific facts and the Bible. Um, and let me just say this, science is changing constantly, is it not? So when we talk about science, we need to make sure that we're talking about scientific facts. And if you look at scientific facts, you'll find that the Bible is in harmony with science. For example, did you know that ancient people had different ideas of what supported the earth? They used to believe that the, that the Greeks used to believe that the earth was supported on the, on the back of an immense giant named Atlas. That's what supported the earth. Did you know that other ancient peoples like Hindus and Chinese used to believe that the earth was supported on the back of elephants? On the back of elephants. There's a scientific fact for you. And a thinking man came along and said, well, what's the elephant supported on? He said, well, the elephants are supported on the back of a huge tortoise. And then a thinking man came along and said, well, what is the tortoise supported on? He said, well, the tortoise is supported on the back of a coiled snake. They said, well, what's the snake supported on? Well, the, they said the snake's not supported on anything. It's swimming in a cosmic sea. Well, where did the cosmic sea come from? You know, you just keep going and going. Those were supposed facts. Let me ask you a question. What's the first book of the Bible chronologically? It was not Genesis. It was the book of Job, actually, chronologically. And you know what Job says? Job says before um, we had telescopes or before we had satellites or before we could take pictures in outer space of the earth, all the way back in the very beginning when Job wrote, he said this, he said, he stretches out the north over the empty place and he hangs the earth upon what? Nothing. He hangs the earth on nothing. How, how did Job know that? I mean, we're talking... We're talking a long time before the time of Christ. You know, over 2,000 years before Christ. And here is Job who is writing and he says, God hangs the earth on nothing. How could Job possibly know that? Unless the God who created the world also inspired the words that Job wrote. Okay? Okay. That's 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 incredible when you think about that. Um, that Job said he hangs the earth on nothing. Did you know also that ancient people used to believe that the earth was flat? By the way, some people still do today. I'm not exaggerating. The Flat Earth Society came about in 1956 and it still exists today. Uh, I don't want to offend anybody. Anybody here members of the Flat Earth Society? They, they believe the earth is flat. 
1980, a member of the Flat Earth Society named Charles Johnson actually managed to get an article published in Science Digest in which he claimed that the Earth must be flat because otherwise there would be curvature on bodies of waters like Lake Tahoe. And, the best of his no and to the best of his knowledge, there was no evidence that the water was anything other than flat. Okay, well, whatever. You can believe that if you want that the earth was flat. Some people believe that. Now, some people say, you know, well, the people in Columbus Day, you know, they believe that the earth was flat. But since doing some research on that, actually, they didn't believe that. Uh, that went <clears throat> actually 2,000 years prior to that. Um, you know, they, they held some a view that was different. But, but how do we know that, what the, earth, that the earth was round? Uh, did you, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah was written 750 years before the time of Christ. And Isaiah wrote this. He says, it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereover as grasshoppers. So when he says circle here, the word that he uses is the Hebrew word for spear or ball. Not a flat circle, but a, a round globe, a spear, a ball. Now again, Job, excuse me, Isaiah wrote this. 750 years before Jesus Christ came. And Isaiah said he sits upon the globe of the earth, the sphere of the earth. And again, the question I would like to ask is, how did Isaiah know that without a picture from NASA? How, how did he know that? Unless the same God who created the world or in the universe also inspired a book. And when the Bible speaks of scientific facts, it speaks accurately about those things. Well, how many stars do we have? You know, before the invention of telescopes, some of the references to stars in the Bible probably appeared to be exaggerated. The angel of the Lord said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Uh, and the Bible actually says in Jeremiah 33, that the stars, the host of heaven are, are, you can't count them. They're numberless. You can't count them. The stars are countless in the heavens. Did you know that? And of course, mankind has always been fascinated with the stars. Um, and many people have tried to count the stars. We're talking about ancient peoples tried to count the stars. Ptolemy, he, he, he looked up into heaven, he started counting and he came up with 1,056 stars. He wrote that down as a fact. Did you know? Thank you, Ptolemy. Now we know how many stars we have. We have 1,056 stars. And then another man came along um, after him. And, and uh, you know, I could give different guys, Hipparchus and others who came along and counted the stars. And you have different numbers by different people who, counts, who counted the stars. If one counts every star that's, that's visible from every point on the globe... The maximum number of stars they may be seen, but that can be seen by the naked eye is around 4,000. But 4,000 is certainly not countless or numerous, as the Bible says. But in 1610, Galileo invented a crude telescope. He pointed that telescope up into the heavens. He looked through it. And when he did, he gave a gasp, backed away. And he said this. There are more stars than can be numbered. There are more stars than you can count. And now, of course, with the invention of telescope and the discovery of countless more st of stars, scientists now estimate that the universe contains at least, I don't know what this number is. Thank, thank you for that testimony, brother. That's a lot. But do we really not know that that's the end? Because the universe is constantly expanding and so on and blah, 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 blah. So yada, yada. So basically, we could say that the, that the stars are numerous, that, that you just can't count all of them, you know. Well, Jeremiah said that already, that the host of heaven are countless without number. Again, we see the harmony between scientific facts and the Bible. You know, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. I'm going to have to quit here. 
And uh, did you know that years ago they would practice something called bloodletting? And they believed that, you know, you had to balance out your bodily fluids, and if they weren't balanced out, that you could get sick. And so if you were sick, you had to, you had to, they had to bleed you. Interesting fact, did you know that's the way George Washington died? Uh, he got sick, and they, they began to bleed him, and he got, didn't get better, and they continued until they literally bled him to death because people believed that bad blood made you sick. The circulation of blood was not discovered until 1616, and yet thousands of years before that, the Bible says in Leviticus 17.11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. God said that. And who wrote Leviticus? It was Moses. Where did Moses learn this? And some people say, well, it was from the science of the Egyptians, Egyptian medicine, really. Well, the Egyptians were well trained and very brilliant people. They were um, able to do mummified bodies and, and so on. They built these great pyramids. And uh, in the book, None of These Diseases, uh, S.I. McMillan refers to an ancient medical book called the Papyrus Ebers. This was written in 1552 B.C., Remember, the Exodus was at 1446 B.C., so this would be right around the time of Moses. And in this book, the Papyrus Ebers, it gives some of the Egyptian medical practices. For example, to prevent hair from turning gray, you anoint it with the blood of a black calf that has been boiled in oil with the fat of a rattlesnake. Anybody want to try that remedy? For people who are losing their hair, according to the Papyrus Ebers, apply a mixture of six facts, fats, those are the horse, the hippopotamus, the crocodile, the cat, the snake, and the ibex, which is a wild goat. You mix all those together, won't lose your hair. According to this book also, to strengthen your hair, anoint it with the tooth of a donkey, crushed, and honey. For an embedded splinter, you take worm's blood and donkey dung and rub it on this sore. According to Dr. McMillan, other drugs used by the Egyptians were lizard's blood, swine's teeth, putrid meat, stinking fat, moisture from a pig's ear, milk, goose grease, donkeys, hooves, excretion from animals, including human beings, donkeys, antelopes, dogs, cats, and even flies. I don't think Moses learned that principle from Egyptian medicine. I don't think he learned that the life of the flesh is in the blood by studying at the University of Cairo or any Egyptian university. No, Moses knew because God told him. And uh, that God said that the life of the flesh, and when the Bible says flesh, the body. Where does the body get its life from, physical life? From the blood that circulates through our body. And that principle Moses knew way, 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 way long ago. Why? Because the same God that created us wrote the scripture. And so the Bible's in harmony there. Now we have to end here, but we'll pick up next week. We're going to continue to talk about the scientific accuracy of scripture, and then we'll talk about fulfilled prophecy, historical accuracy. We'll give you some other reasons why we know that the Bible is the inspired word of God. All right. Let's all stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. and We're going to have our service in just a few minutes. Father, thank you again for your word and how it instructs us. Lord, may you give us all the deep seated conviction that the Bible is indeed your word. Father, bless our service to follow and use it to just strengthen hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.